Okay, folks, here we are this morning. We're going to be talking about on the Five Property Show uh, outgrowing your home. It's often a dilemma most people come across because guess what? You grow up, things change, it all goes pear shaped sometimes, and sometimes it works for you, and sometimes it doesn't. But at some point in time, you have to get it right when it's the time to upsize. Uh, you have to get it right when it's time to downsize, and this is what yeah. the show is all about today. So, you know, people outgrow their homes, don't they, Richard? Um, for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Um, from pure practicalities to aspirational dreams. It, you know, the typical example about I've always fancied a house in the East Nuke. I've always fancied a yeah. house in St Andrews. It's my dream. You know, I was speaking to somebody actually uh, last week. It's my it's my dream to have a house in the East Nuke. Um, good luck with that. <laughs> You're going to have to have a big budget. Yeah, I know. Um, although I'm, I'm about to say I'm about to put a three bedroom on in Pitt and Weem, a terrace house. And I tell you what, it's going to be around about the two hundred thousand price point, and um, that's pretty that's good. Well, actually, that's pretty good. Yeah. Literally a hundred yards from the Fife Coastal Path and Westbury's project and everything. Um, it's a fantastic property. Um, I'm always tempted to move to Snook myself. <laughs> <laughs> See that two bedroom bungalow I had to downsize to. Maybe I should just move to the Snook. Okay, um, so the outgrow their home. Uh, maybe your family's growing. Uh, you're thinking about schools, or uh, simply uh, you can afford to go up market. Whatever schools lies behind your story, one, yeah. really. Yeah, Richard, what are you going to say? I was just going to say schools are a big one, especially with like, the schools we've got here in Fife. Obviously, you've got Madras, you've got Wade, the Wade Academy and things as well. So schools oh, are sorry, a big driver yeah. for people. Although now you could, you know, you, you, on the affordability index, uh, although even starting to catch up with these new in terms of prices, um, yeah. on the affordability index, and that's probably because of the train station going straight through Edinburgh and stuff like that, um, I think that will have a huge impact on property prices, especially in the leave mouth area. Um, and and the, the demographic of people that want to live in Leedmouth, I would say. Uh, I do think a lot of people will, because of the cost of living, and it will continue to rise regardless. You know, it always has and it always will. That's just the way the capitalistic system works. Yeah. Uh, people will look at Edinburgh, they'll look at um, they'll look at the East Newton and stuff like that and think, you know what? Um, or they'll look at St Andrews, you know what? I could have, you know, Leedmouth's a pretty good place. It's got a beautiful beach. Um, it's a really good area and the price point's more affordable. Um, cost of living's more affordable as well. And I could easily commute into work uh, to what I want to do. Uh, and I could easily go into where I want to live um, or where I, where I work. And, uh, and I could have a more relaxing lifestyle. I think there's a big pursuit for this, isn't there? Yeah. Like Leedmouth is an area, I mean, the train station is going to be brilliant. And um, it's not going to happen overnight, but as we'll see in the next couple of years how that will uh, have a positive effect. But even, I think oh, there's people think. there's people out there that will think, hey, come on, where's all the businesses? Where's yeah. everything? Where's 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 all my stuff? And it's like, wait a minute, we've only been the train station's only been open for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think even without the train station, Leeds a good in between, like you say, obviously you think of Edinburgh, you think of St Andrews, you think of East Nuke, and really in proximity. You're you're right in the middle. So and it's not far, so it's a good area. Twenty minutes, half an hour in the car, yeah. easily. Um, and, and I think that's going to make a fundamental difference in people's mindsets. Um, so really, what what lies behind your story, upsizing is an exciting prospect. There's no doubt about that. And the next chapter of your life uh, begins to unfold. Um, the eternal dilemma is, do you stay and improve or extend? Or do you sell up and move? Love it, love it, or list it. <laughs> I think it effectively, time. isn't it? It's, a, yeah. I mean, it's a great program, isn't it? But, yeah. but that's the reality. It's when we go out to see everybody every single time. That is a dilemma we put in front of people, yeah. and we deliver the facts, and they, it's up to them to make the decision on facts rather than just people's opinions. Because there is times, very few, I must, I must add, that I walk into somebody's house, and by the time I'm finished with delivering the facts, they're like, "I'd be better staying where I am." Yeah, you're damn right. You would, you know, it doesn't make any sense spending all that money, paying all that stamp duty to move to another property without any guarantee that it's going to give you what you were expecting. Yeah. Even to find the property, actually. I loved uh, your feedback you got yesterday um, for the person that you've listed for and they've wrote about the listing and the pictures and, the, and how it presented. And they're like, I'm actually even considering buying my own house back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, That's the yeah. ultimate goal, isn't it? If you can, yeah. if you can convince the seller that's that you know they would they would want to do that, um, then you can convince the public as well, um, and the buyers out there are looking at all that footage and all yeah. that information that uh, on a similar theme is uh, uh, too. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you've got to remember, you can't make it drink. Yeah. Oh, sometimes you can. <laughs> sometimes you can if you understand what you're doing and the psychology behind all this. 
This is what we talk about on these shows. This is why it's so important to engage with these shows, especially if you're a seller and especially if you are a buyer. As an investor as well, you know, yes. it's always good information for investors, uh, landlords and, uh, and, and and tenants as well sometimes. You know, tenants can get a lot out of us because we cover every single subject. This is not just a single subject about, yeah, you've outgrown your own home. So that's only people who are going to appeal to here. It's like we cross across all, 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 all uh, demographics in terms of what yeah. we are talking about. Um, so given that both options take time, uh, planning and money. Yeah. Your first protocol is getting complete clarity over your lifestyle changes um, you're looking to make. Remember, the words are complete clarity that you're looking to make. Um, so with the answers to the questions like, you know, what sort of questions should we be asking ourselves? We're going to talk about in this, Richard. Today, I think really looking at what are your upsides and goals? Um, what could you extend or rework um, your current home, the whole thing, love it or list it, you know, could you actually change what yeah. you've got and stay where you are? Um, what do the building works that maybe you require, what, what entails and what's entailed in that? Uh, what should you consider when you're upsizing to another home? Uh, and what are the immediate ongoing and the ongoing costs of upsizing? So that's yeah. a really important one. Um, and we'll cover that uh, obviously today. Because sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to move. And then they think, oh, I've got this cost and this cost and I have to pay that. And, do you know, there's a lot involved. We talk Once about you work a lot. All that out, sometimes it's not even worth moving because the, that, the yeah, that's the cost the to extend can make a fundamental difference, couldn't it? Yeah, definitely. I but am. you've got to make sure if you extend, you can add the value, and the value will be uh, more or less banked into the property itself. In other words, you, you know, whatever you do to the property, you're not going to price your property at the market because there's only a finite amount of money you can get yeah. for a property in that area. However, you know, I definitely think there's some areas. Um, around Fife are definitely undervalued and I know why they're undervalued but I'm not going to discuss it here it's another that's another story and that's an insight into yeah. why we sit down with people and tell them why the area is so undervalued and um, we recognized that a long time ago probably 2018-2019 in the East Nuke area um, definitely and that's why we've got that boom overall and it's still beginning to climb incidentally year on year actually Fife property prices have actually dropped by minus point six percent or something like that so it's neither here nor there so we're back mm -hmm. at the prices that we were almost a year ago so for anybody wanting to understand property prices and where you are right now if you got a valuation a year ago you're probably around about that price just now yeah. however we're about a clever marketing and understanding where your buyers needs are yeah you could possibly push that at the end and actually get a better figure than the home report itself uh, and that's what we talk about in these shows yeah i think so whether you're busting at the seat or look yeah. for a new chapter of the surroundings. This is what this is all about. Um, if you need successful upsizing and to find a home that's a perfect fit for you. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was going to say. And 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 just to lead in, obviously, mm -hmm. to these questions and, and, and what you're going to say, Jim, is we're going to look at setting your upsizing goals and, and seeing what they actually are first. Well, what what would you be doing then? I mean, what's your thoughts on the upsizing goals? You know, when people are upsizing, what what what's the type of things they should be thinking about? Because I get this off, or, or I get this this question asked a lot from people. It's like, you know, I'm, what should I be thinking about? What should I be doing? What should I be focusing on? What things are and because because you don't know what you don't know, and that's yeah. why you get a specialist in to understand that because they know what you should really know, and they're able to deliver these facts. Yeah, I mean, the upsizing for everyone and that decision is different for everyone. And a great way to maybe get the ball rolling is to maybe sit down, have a think, write down everything that maybe you hope to achieve and get out of your new home and mm. the environment that you intend to have. And that, that really break that down. And, and like you say, get that clarity on what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, mm. And start with maybe a wish list and maybe break it down into categories. Maybe have, say, three categories um, and think about inside first. Think about, I mean, like you say, if you're first at the scenes, do you need more bedrooms for maybe children? Or do you want a large kitchen diner? Um, maybe you have a partner moving in. Maybe you want an annex. Maybe you've got a parent or an elder, elderly relative. Um, a place to work from home. Um, or even just a wellness space. Or e even, possibly, have maybe a cinema room. Uh, you know, I've got a cinema room now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that the last time I was in, but yeah, it's like so. Yeah, make that make that list and and start off with inside and think right, what extra space do I actually need? It's quite important when you look at the inside, 
um, that you look at all options, isn't it? I mean, because yeah. there is you, 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 primarily what you're wanting to do. If you're if you're in a house, you've got four bedrooms and one reception room. There's no much you can do about that. Yeah. But your one reception room might actually cover the whole width of the property. Now I'm thinking about Newark Place or Newark Road and St Monas, yeah. for example. Some of these chalet style properties actually have the lounge at the front and then it open plans to the dining room to the rear. And it's mm -hmm. like you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, if you really wanted to do something about that, you could take that wall away, you can close that front bit off from the lounge at the front, you could make that another bedroom, and you could actually have, you could open up uh, and you could redesign your kitchen to have an open plan kitchen and plan living room and room. dining in yeah. between because it's got enough space because it is literally the width of the house for the kitchen and the end of the dining room. So when you think about that, you think about, yeah, we could actually do that without actually needing to move. And, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I know because the price of moving could be astronomical in consideration to the price of actually just uh, redesigning the house and repurposing some of the rooms. If you do have two reception rooms, so and you've got three or four uh, bedrooms, and um, now a reception room, just so everybody understands what a reception room is, it's something like a living room. It's a sitting room. It could be a lounge. It could be a garden room. It could be. It could be a dining room. Mm -hmm. Um. And you have to work out, can that actually be repurposed as a bedroom? And, and, and exactly what I said, Richard, it's you've got it's maybe open plan to the lounge or the living room. And then you've got to think, OK, if you close that off, can you come in from that a different angle? I mean, there's a classic example with that one, actually. When you think about that, if you look at the ex-local authority flats, yeah, they've all got the bedrooms coming off the living room. Yeah, a lot of them do. That's two right, bedrooms, yeah. don't they? So, so effectively, I, I thought, yeah, you could redesign this all. But the reality is, if you really wanted to do that, you could actually just close off the dining room, or stud, put a door in it, and then you've got another bedroom off the living room, yeah. straight away, without actually doing anything. You've created another bedroom for for what the best part of maybe a thousand pound to do that. And that's where when you when you do this, if you were to do like a list and think about the inside and think right, and if the main thing is I need an extra bedroom. Then you've actually been and writing things down creates that kind of clarity like that's the main thing i need and then look at what you've already got and think i could already do this i don't need to move yeah so yeah, it's a good point yeah good point larger dining area um if you want a table sometimes you know the, the thing that used to get me all the time i remember starting out in my first flat and we never had anywhere else to go so everything was just a tray on your knee uh, while mm -hmm. you watched the television uh, yeah. you were you, there was nowhere to sit at a table there was nowhere to take time out there was just like you had the living room you had the kitchen off it that was the end of it that's all you had but that's all i could afford at that time yeah so so dining rooms are quite important as well for people and possibly a larger uh, kitchen diner and actually maybe even redesigning your kitchen because often a lot of people put a big island in the middle which essentially it could have been a breakfast bar or it could have been taken away classic examples is uh, let's look at dyke newton green gates you know, yep. the three bedroom houses there, their kitchens are massive. You can actually get a yeah. dining table in the middle of the kitchen. Yeah, they are big kitchens. I've even done in my own house. I've done because I've got like that. I've got a long lounge with the dual aspect windows and I've got a dining table at one end and my living room at the other. Yeah. And you could essentially if you, if you really wanted to push the boat out and you never had a kitchen, you could have got a kitchen at the far end. You could have got a dining table in the middle and you possibly could have got a wee seating area at the front. Yeah, in, in in a different environment, maybe yeah. St Andrews or something like that. That's 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 possibly what they're doing in St Andrews, isn't it? With some of the some of the two bedroom flats or the one bedroom flats, they're converting the kitchen into another bedroom, and then mm -hmm. they're putting the kitchen into the living room, um, and it's primarily purposed and 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 uh, targeted at students, for example, and yeah. and for for letting. Um, so that that's a that's a classic example about how things are repurposed over in the St Andrews area, um, and and. Lomond, uh, Laman, Laman Garden, Laman, Laman, Laman Road. Laman yeah, Drive. Laman Drive. There you go. Okay. <laughs> all the number of all the street names you have to remember. <laughs> is it Shore Street? Is it Shore Road? Is it you know? There's. The, I mean, you know, even even when you look, see the amount of Shore Roads and the amount of Shore Streets, yeah. just in the, the East UK area, West Four Street, East Four Street, <laughs> and there's all the uh, Road, Streets in here. Toll Road, March Crescent. March Street, March Road, March Crescent, <laughs> like all these different things. Eh? Um, yeah. So so that yeah. would be a good one to think about. But then also you've got the classic example about someone else is moving in. Yeah. And they've possibly got kids. You've met them, you know, you've met them on a dating site or something like that. You've decided that you're going to move in together and you've got an amalgamation. Of two families that, basically yeah. coming together. Yeah, definitely. That's, a, that's a quite a common thing. 
uh, families merging and it's like god we need extra space so yeah definitely think about the inside I and think then, the one I think the one that we'll have to think about as well is definitely and, and you'd mentioned it there about the elderly relative. I, I focus yeah. on this quite a bit in all the bigger properties now mm -hmm. because I, I see the advent of of a lot of people deciding to have their relatives um their maybe their mum and dad or something like that, or their you know, an elderly parent, uh, grandmother, grandfather, if they're still going um actually staying with them because it's they've yeah. got a house on all, all on one level. And and that I thought because you know what it's like. I mean, care costs are something ridiculous. They're about fifty to sixty thousand yeah. pound a year. Yeah, it's crazy. Man. And it's like I'll look after them myself for that. Good, I could yeah. <laughs> I could have a full time salary and, and just look after them in my own house. That's the sort of thing you've got to then consider. It's like, do you actually want to pay fifty to sixty thousand pounds to someone else to look after your elderly parents? Um, or or do you just you, would you just want them to stay with you? And they, I mean, for some people, it's a it's a challenging uh, a challenging <laughs> endeavour. Um, after all, because you've been away from each other for a long time. But it, but it is something really to consider. And it is something I talk about a lot about what potential a property can have. Victoria Road's a classic example that I did yesterday on number yep. twenty nine on the on the um, pre portal yep. uh, in order to launch that because that had a I mean that had. Um, had a huge dining kitchen. You could even have a lounge in there as well, because it's right off the back, extended uh, to the back. And then you've got the dining room, you've got the living room at the front, and they're massive rooms because it's the traditional Victorian houses. So these are all things to think about. So when we come to, we've got, we've done the inside, and we've thought about the, you know, wellness spaces as well, and uh, you know the odd cinema room that you can have. Um, but what, what, what do we need to think about when it comes to the outside of a house then? Yeah, so you do that, think about the inside, then think about the outside. And obviously, straight away, you're thinking, right, okay, a garden, possibly if it's a flat or something, maybe you've got a balcony space or something that, that's going to be private and you're in your own. Maybe you need a space for children. Do you know pets is a, is a really common one uh, to have space for them to run around um, or even having space for parking uh, and yeah. maybe one yeah. car or maybe more than one car. I mean, a lot of homes now have more than one car and parking's a big thing. And uh, having yeah, that off street parking is a big bonus, and a lot of people, a lot of reasons why people move, especially when they go to places like Crail. If oh, you're yeah. going into Crail and the High Street, yes, that's really challenging. I mean, that one that we've just put on um, at West Green, um, that's got a garage. You know, basically, yeah. you just open the garage and you roll your car into it. But but when you go about West Green, it's like it's really difficult, especially when it comes to the season, where it's the crafts and all the events that go on um, in the East New area. Uh, yeah. then you're just overcrowded with parking round about the area and, and there's nowhere for you to do. So it's ideal to have off-street parking. A lot of people actually move out to uh, Pinkern, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Betts Homes area, um, yeah. uh, just off of Room Bay in order to, in order to you know, relocate, in order to get the off-street parking that you talked about. Balconies are important as well. And as you said, That's I often think about people with indoor cats, you know, yeah. just to give them some sort of way to get out and possibly think just about it, how it works for maybe putting a, you know, some sort of uh, fencing or something like that or netting, you know, round a, round a balcony so they can get mm -hmm. out and have some fresh air and, and watch everything else and just engage rather than actually sitting in the house all the time. I kind yeah. of think cats are always meant to be outside. Um, yeah, it's just a natural environment, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think so when we come to that then, then what, what, you know, the other one to think about then probably is really lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah, because and and that really comes down to, um, I think locations that was the a big part. I mean, we've got all the things like bedrooms and parking and storage and all the things that people think about. But location is right up there, and and the lifestyle that that location could give you, and upgrading maybe to a more expensive neighbourhood, maybe yeah. it's a quieter yeah. street, maybe the school catchment zones like we spoke about, uh, faster transport connections like we spoke about the train station, access to shops and amenities. Or even just looking for that, maybe that sea view or that countryside view, you know, improving mm -hmm. your surroundings. And it's amazing how much that kind of lifestyle could have a big positive impact on people. And and, and that's why people move. Sometimes a lot of the time it's, it's because the location is key. And you'll you'll find people that will look for, well, I need a three bedroom or I need something, you know. And then they find the right location. And it's like, oh, well, I could kind of compromise on that. So you really didn't need that. In the first place, yeah. it was more about where it, where it is rather than what it is. Uh, sometimes it's the other way around, but um, you do find lifestyle and location are important. I think lifestyle and location are a huge factor in yeah. somebody making a decision. I don't think the practicalities of 
you know, whether it's a three or a four bedroom, uh, are, are, are fundamentally essential as long as they've got enough. So the bare yeah. minimum they'll get away with, but they'll, they'll take the bare minimum as long as it's the location that they want and, yeah. and the lifestyle that'll, that'll afford them. Hence the reason why I fo we focus on this a lot, isn't it? About what yeah. a property will give you in terms of lifestyle, because somebody outside the area has no idea what this area has to offer. Yes, it's amazing how sometimes people are so like stuck on uh, this is exactly what I need. This is my criteria. I can't deviate for that. But then you find them a property and a, and a location that they absolutely love, and then they're like, okay, well I can compromise now because so. And they, they probably didn't even know it themselves until they seen that that, that uh, location. You just need to roll them down the beach and let them see that, and it's like yeah. I, I'm sold. <laughs> it's like I'm sold straight away. But but often because we've been here all these years and all the people have been here all these years as well, we just all take it for granted. I know. I'd, I'd sometimes I, I do it. I'll do it a lot. Do you know we're, we're that busy and we live here and obviously we obviously have, well we grew up here and things. But I finished work the other day, got the dog, went down the beach, and I'm like, you just forget it's here. <laughs> you just take it for granted that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think once you've compiled a unique combination of your upsides and goals. Yeah. Um, you'll know whether your existing home has the potential to fulfill your dreams or is it time to find probably somewhere new so this yeah. this is then talking about upsizing but let's talk about upsizing your current home what yeah. sort of i mean if you if you love the idea of upsizing where you already live um it's worth exploring the untapped potential in your current home i suppose um, and yeah. so what are some of the ways it, we've seen people upsize without actually having to move then yeah well you, you used a good example there Jim of it obviously if you've got that reception room that you could change into a bedroom and things but converting a loft uh, into maybe like a bedroom suite uh, and, and getting that quite popular in the East yeah. Nook yeah and you get that great view uh, and um, and then you get the barking and making it into maybe two children's rooms maybe you could even split it into two smaller rooms that are fit for children or one big room, uh, bedroom suite. And like you say, if you're going to go up the way in places like the East Newark, you're going to get that view. Well, the one I'm just about to do, I'm just about to go out and try and uh, get sorted. It's, they've just signed all the, the details today and yeah. the agreement's in place. Um, it's actually got a net loft and next door has actually put a master with an ensuite and an office uh, net loft. in that net loft. And it's yeah. got actual proper stairs going up to it. Just like yeah. Inverary Street had, and um, mm -hmm. so it was designed as a fisherman's house. Um, yeah. And next door's got the exact template that everybody should be using to add the significant value to it and actually more space. So it's, I think it's going to be really, really popular when it comes on. Yeah, the conversion of the net lofts in East Newark are amazing because they're such a big space that they're bigger than a normal loft space. They're just they're huge. And then no doubt about it, it's what you said. Eh? It's the views. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as you just look at the window, it's like wow right over to edinburgh and on a clear day you can see the ski slope on the hill yeah you could yeah I mean, on a clear day you can see right across it's brilliant so now this yeah. is actually quite interesting because we we talked about this i talked to this with a client of west green yeah. about the garage about yeah. converting that um empty space and the possibility of doing that now what's your thoughts on this yeah and i think the garage conversion um i mean a lot of people garage is storage not a lot of people don't put their cars in their garage some do but anyway especially if you've got attached uh, as an integral garage then you could have that maybe the next living space but i think most importantly you you touched on the gym as an annex perfect for maybe an elderly relative um, and it's an extra bedroom and you could even get a bathroom in there as well you could have like a whole suite the classic i see is you know the, when you see a double garage on the side of a house you immediately yep. when you walk in the door you kind of think to yourself can i actually get through from the hallway into that into that garage yeah. is there a possibility to do that even though it's not integrated uh, and if the answer to that is yes then you could subdivide the garage quite easily have a single garage on the end and actually repurpose the you know the other single garage as a usable space like you said with yeah. a, a, a master bedroom or an ensuite off the back yeah yeah, it can, and, it's, and because it's already there, it's quite easily done. It's not a big, uh, it's not a big undertaking uh, to do that. Mm. And it adds, like, say, and planning, uh, planning's typically, planning is typically sympathetic because if you've got a double garage, you're going to have a huge driveway, so you're easily going to probably get three cars on it anyway. Yeah. And that's typically the benchmark when you go from, I think it's three or more bedrooms, you you know, in a property when you're starting to do that, you, they insist that you you need to have sort of off street parking for about three cars or more. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of thing. Uh, what other things do we need to think about then? Um, 
kitchens, cellars, yeah. stuff like that. A lot of people want to have a bigger kitchen and a dining kitchen. And rather than do the move, you could actually mm -hmm. extend your kitchen, create a large family uh, hub as such, um, one that opens out onto the garden, um, and it's and then freeing up your reception room that you've got and have that for its fit like its usual purpose. You, know, you might yeah. have like like myself, you might have a, a dining table in your lounge to utilize that space as dining, but extend your kitchen, have that big kitchen, and if it opens out onto the garden, that's just a plus. Well, that's that's exactly what I thought about Victoria Road when I walked into that dining room. It's actually it was a dining room, and I kind of think, wait a minute, the, the kitchen's massive. The mm -hmm. kitchen's bigger than the floor space in my first flat. And I was thinking to myself, you could get a, you could get a, a, a suite in here. You could get a dining table over here, and you've got your main kitchen at the front, the, the rear of the property, with all the activity space you need to do for preparation and everything like that. So it, it makes absolute sense for taking that other room and just repurposing it for something else, especially if you've got an elderly relative, because there's a WC downstairs as well. So there's one level living for someone uh, in some shape or form. So it's a, it's a good shout, uh, you know, extending the kitchen as well. Um, and even a lot of these properties are top tip. If you're wondering whether you can extend your home out the back, if possibility, if it makes sense, have a look at some of the other properties around about you and see what they've done. If people have put conservatories out, if they've put maybe sunrooms off the back, if they've extended themselves, you'll notice straight away. You'll also notice Veluxes in the in the in the roof space at the top. So it'll give you a good idea if they've done anything. And then what to do is go to uh, go to online planning for your local authority. Just go into Google online planning for whatever your local authority is. For ours is Fife. Online planning for Fife. And then you look up the street name, and then it'll give you a list of everybody that submitted planning. And then you'll be able to see if somebody's actually extended into their attic space or extended at the back and what they actually did. You'll get to see the plans. Why yeah. reinvent the wheel? Just, <laughs> if somebody's just, yeah. done it already and it works, it's like, why would you then do something different if it works? You'll get an, an exact blueprint about what, what you can do with your existing property and, and how you would do it. All you need to do is then make sure you comply with the current building standards, which are obviously upgraded you know, often every year. Um, and then you obviously have to make sure you'll get you'll get planning permission more than likely. It's very unlikely if you've got the exact same property with the exact same fo um, footprint it's on, with the exact same size of garden. Uh, it's very unlikely they, could, they would knock you back unless there's some sort of um, possibly there's a conservation order being put in place recently, or another possibility is you've got a listed property um, yeah. because it is not. There, there's no surprise, is there? Sometimes you you you'll see a grade C listed property or a grade. I've got it on West Shore at the front of St Monans. Uh, there's two at grade B listed um, and there's every other one round about at C. And it, the two are just like for a big, huge beer cellar. It was out the back garden, which I never knew existed. It's like <laughs> some it's like some for the smugglers days. And that's another <laughs> one that we're potentially going to be bringing to market. That's going to be something awesome. Um, yeah. I'll need a big torch to actually get into this cave because it literally is a cave. Apparently it was used for people to go and uh, Come out somewhere else and and some mornings after coming off the well, beach. That'll make a good. That'll make a good uh, video too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so you that's you got. Uh, that's but then that brings, brings us to sellers, doesn't it? Yeah. That brings us to the seller, um, which you was what we're talking about. Yeah, you go. You, we've talked about obviously going up, and we've talked about obviously converting and extending out. But yeah, going down, uh, going down. If you've got cellars or basement areas, do you know what one that makes me think this, about this? It's the one on Scooty Road that we've got. Yeah, that's an amazing. And all of the houses along that row have got the same. They've all, they all go down because they're Glen Morrison, Glen yeah, Morrison, or something like that. Like, yeah, oh, it's got the four yeah. basement rooms out the back, and then yeah. it's got that huge back garden. And if you look at uh, Glebe Street next door, it actually has another two houses in the same footprint. Yeah. And I thought, right. good, you can get another two semi-detached houses in this garden, as well that's as having big, that basement. That's a big plot, and it's got a lot, uh, a lot of space inside the property as well. So yeah, and you, and you could repurpose that, like you say, Jim. We could do the cinema room. You could do a music studio. You could have a children's space. You could have, do you know, you could have a guest suite. You could do anything with. It. Um, and it's it's um, a real bonus if you've got a space like that. Utilize it. Um, Definitely. I'm going to share that. I'm going to share that one online. Actually, I'm going to share it with everybody. <laughs> uh, so I'll dig it out and just share it while you're talking. Yeah. Okay. So what what yeah. else have we got to think about then? Self, you know, self-contained cabin take the back. Yeah. Um, just, that, that seems to be popular. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a really popular thing, especially since we had the whole lockdown and everybody living in their garden type thing. But cabins down the bottom of the and cabins have come a long, long way. They're not just a summer house now. We get table and chairs. 
Do you know, people have got them, their proper rooms, they've got double glazed uh, windows and doors, they've got toilet facilities, do you know, and, the, and they're fully functioning suites as such. So, yeah, um, yeah. so you shared that. Yeah, that's a good one, Jim, the, the, the one that's Jury, I couldn't remember if it was Jury Street or Scooney Road, I think it's just on the corner. Jury um, Street, uh, I just yeah. it borders on. I mean, it's a it's a great location. You look at the front, you think, oh, I wouldn't want to live on the main road, but it's like you're no, you're yeah, actually you you're, you're miles back because yeah. you know you could easily have everything at the back of the house. It's uh, you could probably build a, another house in the garden at the back, um, mm -hmm. subject to permission. It and so the self-contained cabin is a really popular thing, isn't it? With the the Hobbit cabins and stuff, isn't? It? Yeah, yeah, and like I say, they've, they've come a long, long way. And uh, they are like fully functioning, complete. You can make them into bedroom suites. You could have them as an actual studio, one or a one bedroom studio. Um, I've seen some spectacular ones, to be fair. Um, but it's like, oh, how, what did you pay for that? Seventy grand. I could have bought a two bedroom flat for that. I know, I know. It's <laughs> like you paid seventy grand for a cabin, and I could have bought a two bedroom flat, which appreciates it in value, and the cabin doesn't. Yeah. As an investor, yeah. I've got to say, I know what one I'd be buying. <laughs> I'd be buying the two bedroom flat, which would make the money to probably end up going financing the cabin rather than actually outlaying on the cash. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Yeah, because then, <laughs> then that would make absolute sense because you, you've got an asset which is growing, which will actually pay for the cabin, which is actually not growing. Um, so, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're keeping your money, um, you're keeping your money stable and you're actually no losing money on it. Yeah, I'd spoke to someone fairly recently and they spent a lot of money on their, their big cabin at the back and it's it's amazing. But if they, and they were thinking about possibly selling and things, but and they were obviously they were bigging up this cabin in the back, which is fine because it's like amazing. But I'm like, you're Probably not going to get, get added to the home report. Yeah, you're not going to get your money back for that, unfortunately. And that's the, that's the thing. I mean, it'll, it'll add to the the um, the uh, saleability of the property in terms of what people look at it and think oh that's good but in terms of the actual value you know i did have a i did have a dilemma up at moat hill and cooper um one time about that it was because he had actually built two cabins at the back now one yeah. of the cabins was a workshop a mechanics workshop where proper you know down in the trench uh, so yeah. you could work on your cars and the other one next door was actually uh, it was had a pool table it had a bar it had the toilets mm -hmm. off the back and everything like that but there were log cabins but proper log cabins with double glazing yeah. and everything um, so I had a bit of difficulty with that. I mean, most estate agents walked out and said, oh, it's 125000 And I'm like, oh, it's a shame that, this, that value kind of get added that way. So I had a wee word with the surveyor. We had a discussion. And they went, yeah, OK. Um, given the circumstances, I think I think it's um, I think it's fair to say that potentially, because this these, stuff, these things won't move. And they won't yeah. really deteriorate as such, like a normal shed does, um, yeah. because they're proper log cabins. He says, no, I think you're probably talking about 140. So we got 140 valuation on them and we sold them for 145 in total with the, with the house. So it yeah. just shows you getting the right person and the right advice and speaking to the right people yeah. can add about 25,000 to your end result just because you've spoken to the right person and got the right advice. Yeah. That is what, our, that's what, that's what world-class estate agent does. They, the, they find the out value. how to solve a problem. Yeah, that's definitely the added value. But when you're thinking about all these changes and things, and we talk about obviously we, we touched on ceiling prices and things um and they are real but they're not fixed forever um, yeah. and if you, if you do really want to know whether what you're doing and what you're planning is maybe too ambitious um then obviously speak to speak to one else uh, we're happy to obviously give you some tips and advice on whether i had doing, it recently yeah. at the back of grassminston and creel yeah they had bought the remember the fire damaged property um, the the empty shell and then the oh, bungalow yeah. the you know the wee yeah. the wee two bedroom uh, house next door but effectively a bungalow terraced or or link detached I think or link semi detached something like that because there was a walkway in between with the you know the 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 roof above it and um, but he came back to me with drawings about what to do and we've you know and and that was the smart move to make because he came back with drawings and then he said to me this is what I'm planning do you think we're actually going to get that i discussed it with the surveyor about where we are in terms of price point i then looked at the square uh, the price per square meter that you would get in that area right now and what's been sold and then i worked out it's like you wouldn't be advised to do to convert the bungalow into anything more even moving into the roof space you'll never recover your money to do yeah. that um but definitely this is where you're going to be if you do that to this house. He was talking about putting it into a townhouse, three levels, and it's like, wow, panoramic views 
right over the countryside. It is in the perfect position because it's south facing. Yeah, that's the advantage. He's on the south facing side, and that's what I would have taken straight away. And the very fact that he's on the end, so he's a link detached farmhouse effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and and once he renovates that, that's going to look superb. And I think it's going to be probably six fifty to seven hundred thousand. Yeah, um, yeah. So so it's a good show. All he needs to do is get a builder to agree to a certain price point. Uh, I would say when you get builders to do stuff, make sure you get a fixed price contract if possible and yeah. get it in writing just in case. Uh, because then it's up to the builder then once you fix the price in the contract to then fix prices in terms of with his suppliers about how much he's going to buy everything for or she's going to buy everything for in order to make sure that contract comes in and delivered at the right price you might want to put in inflationary amounts um, adjustments yeah. but look what happened with the council um that i mean the council got a fixed price contract and the contractor the other now lost uh, 3.5 million because of the price increases and a yeah. loss on the contract and they had no recourse i mean to be honest they should have fired their financial director because yeah. I'll tell you what, the financial director should have picked up straight away that there was nothing in there for any volatile swings in the contract negotiation um, and they were able, weren't able to come back. Now, when you think about things like we're spending millions on, you know, ferries, we're spending millions on a Scottish Parliament, we've spent millions more on the trams and stuff like that. And it's like, you, you're kidding me. They never thought to actually build this in and they just agreed to a fixed price contract. It's crazy. But then yeah. that's how you get experts out in the field in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And as you talk about builders and things, Jim, I think there's a, a lot of things to think about before you get the builders in. Um, mm. And obviously, as well as the inevitable, you're going to have the noise and the dust and things that you're going to have mm -hmm. for building. Uh, building projects require detailed budgeting and planning to have a complete clarity over what you're getting into, uh, which means taking into account a lot of things. And uh, first off, the disruption. Um, and although maybe like a loft conversion might be less madness, then maybe like a full on extension, yeah. uh, life will change when you get the builders into your property. So get clarification on what will be out of bounds in your property and what you're going to, how you're going to be restricted during that time. Because um, yeah. it could go on for a few weeks, even you know months, depending on what you're doing. So you take that you into consideration. You know what builders are like. <laughs> you know what happens. Eh? I could do this in two weeks, and the next minute they're away on another job. Yeah, and you're, like, you're six what, weeks down the line. Sorry, what just happened? <laughs> What just happened to you? It's yeah. like you've bought all these materials up front for them. You've put them on site and they've disappeared to another job. And it, yeah. so so you have to be realistic and factor in your timeline and actually some sort of leeway in the fact that you're not going to get it done in the time that you got it. You're going to get it done. Um, and you just got, I think you just got to accept it. I mean, you'll, you'll get the odd builder. It'll stick to their guns and they'll, they'll be able to do that. But most builders actually jump from job to job. Um, especially yeah. if you're wanting a local builder, it's maybe just uh, two or three people involved in their, their company. They because they get demand from everybody all the time. Yeah. You can't just say, well, I'm working on that person. I can't get around to you and turn business away. That's when they start to juggle. So you often, you have to make sure they've got a track record. I think track yeah. record is important. We fell foul of that, didn't we, with a, with a, a, a refurbisher that we got yeah. for the property management division. And yeah. the fact that when they first started, they would do everything for us. Well, everything for me, because it was my stock they were working on. And yeah. they were doing everything. They got everything sorted out. And then all of a sudden, they got a wee bit bigger. And the next minute, it was like, I'm away doing somebody else's job. Yeah. And then, by the way, I'm away on holiday. And yeah, you can have your holiday. But it's like, did, would you know think about telling me? Did I need to find out in social media when you were on the plane? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you were actually on a job and you were away on holiday without telling me. Yeah, and so that, that that relationship ended quite abruptly um, with a catastrophic failure in that service delivery because the person hadn't scaled up and they hadn't discussed it with it, with, with me, which is a client, uh, beforehand and made sure they had everything in, in place. So therefore, we had to get someone else in to finish off the job. But yeah. luckily enough, it was all built in the fact that I could recharge them. So I was able to recharge them. He yeah, didn't have a leg to stand on job was done this is how important it is to understand contract contract negotiations yeah understand where what 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 comeback you've got in case anything goes wrong yeah yeah definitely and that, so costs and and cost and time is so important get um, it in writing yeah fittings aren't usually included um in builders estimates and things as well so you might get an estimate but make sure that's 
what's what's included in that and what's going to be extra. Make sure you budget for, uh, you know, maybe things like if you're doing like things like bifold doors on the end of your extension or, you know, um, fancy switches. Chrome switches, or, yeah. yeah. Chrome switches rather than the actual. It's like, oh, oh but I, would, I wouldn't have minded chrome switch. Oh, that's, that's going to cost more. Yeah. Sorry. And it's all these uh, well, wee things, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then the classic example is like, but I discussed that at the beginning. It's like, oh, well, you've accepted the quote and that's not got it written on the quote. So I'll have to charge you more for that. See what yeah. I mean? See how that could easily happen? The conversation that you have isn't necessarily what sometimes is on the quote. So when you get the quote from the builder, make sure you make sure it is what you expect it to be and do not assume. Yeah, because that could be a costly mistake. Definitely. Always make sure you confirm the, the entire costs and think about a potential extras and confirm how, to, how, how long it's going to take and, and make sure that you're going to be prioritised. Um, on their work schedule because uh, like you say jim you don't want to be two weeks in and i'm away somewhere else and you're left in a building site they're known to do it eh? and and the th yeah. the problem is if they've got if they've got your kitchen hold right out your bathroom hold right out what yeah. do you do with that yeah. if, if you're if the next builder in line is going to take two months to get around to you, you, you they've got you over a barrel and you can't really yeah. throw them off the job now you're stuck with them so you're just stuck at the mercy so that's why it's important to actually get somebody that's locally recommended somebody that a lot of people have used now see when you go to facebook and you say i'm looking for a builder and everybody just tags builders in please yeah. say you're looking for a builder that you have uh, yeah. that to re recommend for our use uh, somebody that's recommended that you've used yourself already yeah. that's what you say you don't say i'm just looking for a builder or a painter and decorator or a joiner because then you have to go, well, have you used them? Because a lot of people just tag all these people in just to be helpful, but they've never, ever used them. Yeah. So make sure you say, when you're looking for a builder on social media, on your community pages, that one that you've used already, and how did you get on? And then yeah. that's the answer you'll get from these people. They'll tag that builder, they'll say they did this for me, and it was absolutely fantastic. Some might even post photographs of the job. Yeah, and that's re that's recommendation that you want uh, from other people's experience. This is a big plus point for me as well. Make sure you get the permissions for the work or you'll need uh, you'll need either planning permission or building regulations or both from your local authority, um, which can take a couple of months or or, or, a, or an even simple yes. Just but to even get that yes. To make sure that's why it's important to speak to a consultant or a planner or an architect or, you know, whoever. Or I'll be honest, you'll never get your local authority sometimes because they're just overwhelmed. And they yeah. usually say, well, you have to put an inquiry in and it'll cost you a hundred quid to do it. And then we'll get back to you in six weeks with an answer. That's effectively how it works sometimes. That's what I've heard from a lot of my, my customers or my clients. And so I actually say to them, look, you know, I'll put you in touch with a consultant who's used to work in planning, used to be running planning in Fife Council. And yeah. he now is able to consult with you and tell you what you can and can't get away with. And he'll do all the work for you because they love him because he knows how to run the system. So when yeah. he puts an application in, they'll answer him straight away because they know fine, he's crossed all the T's and dotted yeah, all yeah. the I's. It's, there's no hassle there. That's why they don't want a member of the public coming along because it's like, I've got to teach this person from scratch what they should be doing. That's yeah. why it takes so long to get it through. So you're, it's worth investing in a proper planner or consultant or a, a proper architect. It can actually do that work for you. Yeah, and get that through quick as possible. It's actually surprising uh, the amount of people that sometimes get to the decision to sell their property and they've actually done alterations and never got permission to get it done. Yeah, I get it all the time. <laughs> yeah, get it all the time. They've, they put a WC downstairs because they had an elderly parent and needed it. And it's like, OK, so did you get permission for that? Uh, no, I just thought it would be all right yeah. to put it in. And then there's, how long has it been in there? Oh, it's been in for about 15 years. I went, well, you should probably more than likely get a letter of comfort more than yeah. anything. So I'll put you in touch with my consultant. We'll actually yeah. sort all that out for you. So you, when you get to the convincing, we could put your house in the market now. We can get it all through. We can get the home report. We can get everything else. We can market it. But when it comes to convincing, when we finally got it sold, this is going to cause a problem possibly. So this is why we'll have to get the consultant to get in on the ball now. And then we can get that sorted out in the same process so you don't need to wait for it to happen sometimes again get advice from a, some, a professional you know hello <laughs> hello <laughs> um you know get advice from us first um what you should be doing how you should be doing it and how you should be approaching it in order to make sure your your timeline's actually on a critical path in other yeah. words it's all as short as possible and as efficient as possible to make it 
easy for yourself rather than actually getting to the headache and you've not actually done anything about it and then it comes up and convincing because then the person's mortgage they've got in principle now falls over because yeah. you take more than three months and their mortgage yeah. offer's gone they have to renew it times have maybe changed or they're under a, they're under a, a, a timeline and therefore they have to find a house quicker therefore you your sale falls through as a natural result of, of the of the inexperience you had in, in order to think oh you just do it as you go that's why it's important to get somebody beforehand yeah and i think finally as well on the on the building side of things i mean building works can and and they do overrun so it might also be something to put in your budget maybe think about possibly renting a home during that time if the improvements you want to make will cause quite a lot of chaos you might want to be living mm -hmm. somewhere else during that time and i see that quite a lot people coming to uh, to rent for a period of time for improvements and also do you know i get people that have had fire and flood damage insurance claims and come in rent as well so it's quite a common thing let me talk about upsizing now so upsizing yeah. you go into another home i suppose there's yeah. something about moving up the property ladder it really feels like a real step forward mm -hmm. um, so if buying a larger home as part of your upsizing journey um i think here are some things to actually keep in mind stay focused on your upsizing mm -hmm. uh, wish list to ensure that your next home uh, actually makes the grade um, a, a fantastic view if you're looking for that no matter how seductive won't make up for having less space than you need be practical in this endeavor yeah. remember just don't get eaten up by the you know the consumed by the fantastic view fantastic location if it doesn't fit your needs because yeah, you're only compromise if you can yeah. You're going to pay heavily because you're going to have to move again. It's going to cost another £10,000 in the moving costs mm -hmm. um, and disruption as well to you and your family. Um, do you want a home? Here's one thing to think about that's ready to move into or would you like to take on a project? And how much work would you actually want to do? How much work can you are you able to do? That's another thing really to think about because it's mm -hmm. like there's great intentions about how you could do things. I was speaking to someone the other day actually and he says, I'm 59 years old. I'm not in a position where I could do the painting and decorating anymore. I'm just not yeah. that fit. We'll have to get people in to do it. So mm -hmm. to do all this, I'm sitting in right now and actually have my full-time job, which I'm still working in, and coming home absolutely exhausted, I've not got enough hours in the day and I've still not, I've not got the energy for it. So these are the things yeah. to actually think about. So be clear. Be clear as you can with your stage, and I think that's the most important thing, to, to help them to help you. Yeah. You need to you need to be clear on what you're what you're looking for and the extent of what you're willing to take on. Like you say, Jim, you didn't want a big project. If it's just maybe general decoration, you could do. You know, think about the magnitude of what you're taking on because you could, you might buy something and maybe stand in the middle and think, well, how am I going to do all this? And if you can't do it, you're going to have to get somebody else to do it. And can you afford to do that? Do you know, there's lots of things. To think I know. About. By the time you work out the cost, you think, God, I wish I'd never done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the headache involved in having the project manager. Uh, Think, think about the timing as well as, as one of the most important things when you're upsizing another home. Um, yeah. Whether it's the, probably a coincide with the new school year, you're probably going to have to put your house in the market in January to actually hit the new school year to buy your mm -hmm. house uh, to make sure that coincides. Because then you've got the holidays in between and stuff like that as well. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people will quiet at that time of year for buying a house. So that's one of the things I think you really need to think about the timing. New school year, maybe it's a new job role that you're in or something else, or or, or maybe you're getting married, maybe you're getting divorced. Uh, all these different things that could happen in your life, um, which uh, new babies coming along, uh, new member of the family, you're getting together for the first time ever and you're moving in together. These are all the things you've got to think about timing. So work backwards from the deadline. This, yeah. is, why, this is why I said to you straight away, Work backwards from the deadline. So if you're wanting to do it with the coincide with the new school year, generally that's the beginning of August, you need to be August, in your house yeah. settled. So if you're in the August and you're taking about four, four or maybe five months to go through convincing, three on the best three on a best day, um on or on the best year. So if you're taking from three to five months to go through convincing, you work back from August, you're literally around about April, May, June, July, August. Yeah, you're back at April. You're back at now. Yeah. And that's only convincing. That means you you should have had your house sold by now. And you're taking two months to sell a house on average. You know, there's 1,000 properties on the market in five. 500 are getting sold every single month and bought every single month. So therefore, there's two months worth of stock. So on average, it's taking two months. So therefore, you're back in January. You should yeah. have sold your house two months ago if, yeah. you're, if you're hoping you to get to the year. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's so when you think about it, you'll almost be in time for Christmas if you put your house in the market the now. And yeah. I, that that's how that's how it could end up being for most people. So that's why it's important to aim to get your home in the market six months at least before. Yeah. Getting the figures right. How yeah. is it so That's important about the figures then, Richard? Yeah, that is an important thing. And as well as all the excitement of the actual upsizing and moving and things, the costs that come as part of that um, bargain, whether you are moving or, or you're doing the improvements, uh, getting caught out with the nasty financial surprises is not a good thing and can yeah. really mess with your plans. Um, so you really need to remember to budget and think about things like, well, firstly, we'll stamp duty. Everybody forgets about stamp duty. You've got stamp duty, you've got your mortgage arrangement charges, which are usually around about 500, but they could be more. Um, agency fees for selling, obviously your agent fees. Uh, if you are deciding to rent um, out your current home, you need to think about that. Think about yep. your conveyance and services. Then mm -hmm. think you've got, you've got removal firms. Removal really firms. Like, there's a lot involved. To Van think about. hire. Yeah. Furniture. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you think so, when you take all that ADS, if you're, mm -hmm. you know, because you you have to pay ADS if you want to buy your home before you sell your existing home, you can claim it back, but you still have to have the yeah. budget to be able to pay that first. Yeah, so ADS on a hundred thousand pound house is is six thousand pound in Scotland. Yeah. So every hundred thousand you've got, if you're buying a two hundred grand house, you're twelve grand out your pocket oh, over and above yeah. what you've got. Um, can you actually afford to move then? Or do you have to get it to coincide with your house sale? This thing goes back to saying about uh, making sure you manage the sale to coincide with your next move and actually putting on well in advance in order to get somebody to agree to a flexible entry date so you can get your next house and actually be able to move in on the same day you're moving out your existing house. This is all about this is all about uh, chain building, isn't it? This yeah. is all it comes. This is a skill in this kind of market where we are now. Where we're almost in the point of being able, we have to chain build now where people have houses to sell to coincide with the other one whereas before it was the boom market there was lots of rental properties available people just move straight into a rental property yeah. and they says we'll just wait for the right place to come up and then we'll give 20 days notice we can move out no bother yeah. and sometimes we'll be even put our stuff in storage and it'll be an easy gig not anymore the rental market stock has decreased by 15 percent by 60,000 households right throughout scotland and yeah, we've seen it before. You've seen chains. I mean, there's three and four people in a chain at sometimes at least. Well, we know they're three and four, but does does every other agent know they're three and four? Yeah. No, because <laughs> usually when you start asking the question, they're going, "I never really thought about that." It's like, mm -hmm. "Oh my god, not, this, is, this, this, this is this is agent one on one stuff. This is this is the yeah. type of things you should know and we should be able to do. This is like you should know what the position of your buyer is, and you should know what the position of the person buying their you're, house, if that's buyer. the case, yeah. and the person buying their house and the very person down at the very beginning are they a cash buyer and is their mortgage in place if they're no, um, and they're ready to go." Um, yeah. And then that way you've got the chain protected, so you know exactly who everyone's going to coincide at the same time and settle on the same day. That's a real skill to, to yeah. get that to work. The thing as well about upsizing, and, and this is something that, that I've actually uh, experienced myself, is that the ongoing costs of running a, a bigger home. Do you know you've got, yeah. obviously, utility bills, your heating bills and things, council tax will go up, you'll have higher mortgage payments um, as well. There's a lot of things factored in that because I, mean, I, I considered upsizing and I don't really need to. I just wanted to. And then when I sat down and actually thought about why, why you, would you, I do you that? You saved yourself a fortune. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not doing it. That's maybe because you spoke to the right person. <laughs> Wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? I'm, like my mortgage, I fixed my mortgage at 2.9% and I've still got a couple of years left in it. And I'm like, I'm not moving anywhere, um, especially with that mortgage rate. Absolutely. And that yeah. is, it's the ongoing cost that will get most people. And that's why a lot of people yeah. downsize because it's the ongoing cost as well. They're rattling about in a big six bedroom home. Everybody's left now and there's just the two of them or the one of them. And it's like, they really need this house. The garden's got to get done. The council tax and band yeah. F, you know, the utilities are 500 quid a month. And it's like, uh, all this money is just pouring out the door every single time. And you often see in that scenario, they switch everything off and then the house starts to suffer as a result and the value yeah. starts to drop because the windows aren't getting looked after anymore. The, the woodwork and the garden's not getting done as well as it should have been before. Um, all, everything, starts to, everything starts to go to pot. 
and they're only living in key. They're only living in like two rooms of the house eventually. Yeah, and they're living in yeah. two rooms of the house. Get rid of the house then. Get yeah. rid of your emotional attachment. I know it was your family home. I know the kids grew up there and everything like that. But here's the reality: it's going to cost you a fortune. Keep them going like this. Yeah. You could be traveling the world. You could be having 101 days around the world on P&O cruise for £27,000. That's probably how much you're spending every year on the stuff that you don't need and not needing anymore on your existing house if you're down, if you're looking to downsize. Yeah. That's the key. Enjoy yourself. Use the money for something that's more important. Lifestyle, enjoyment, <laughs> relaxation, no stress, easy <laughs> life. Travel. The, I should take more. I should take more on her bike. <laughs> <That's just great. laughs> You're putting yourself a cruise, Jim. <laughs> um, okay, so you know any new furniture and 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 fittings, any fixtures and fittings that you want to buy, and any improvements you intend to make immediately, um, or within the foreseeable future. That's just things to think about as well. And I'm a big fan. If you're not taking your current furniture with you, and you can buy new furniture for the existing house you're in just now to take with you then buy it now and get rid of your old shabby stuff. It sets the scene and it gives a better impression for your house when buyers walk in the door. They don't want to see the stuff that you're going to throw out because you're throwing it out because it's horrible. What do you think they're thinking it? And how does that make it look your house, your house look when people are buying it and people are going mm -hmm. around? They're not buying your furniture, but I tell you what, it sets the wrong impression. Yeah. It, sets the wrong, it sets the impression like, I don't care about this house now. I just want rid of it. Yeah, and that, that, is a, that is a distressed yeah. seller, and you know what buyers can do with distressed sellers: take advantage of it. Advantage That's why you get a, a good estate agent to protect you from that. Yeah, because then you could end up. They end up because uh, they're in that frame of mind. People realize that, use it to their advantage, and they end up selling the property for a, far less than what it's worth. Here's a truth bomb, which yeah. the magazine yeah. estimates. The, the average cost of buying and selling a home is £14,458. Wow. But that varies widely between the higher and lower values. Remember, this is the average. Some yeah. people are paying a lot more than that. Some people are paying a bit less than that. But that's the average. I would never have thought £14,458. It's quite a lot. I mean, 50, you're talking about fifteen grand. Yeah, I was thinking on, on average six or seven thousand. It's like really fourteen grand, but but when you think about everything that's involved and all the stuff that you're doing, then yeah, mm -hmm. and all the costs involved as well. You know, sometimes yeah. it's the new kitchens, it's the new bathrooms, it's the decorating, it's the carpeting, it's all the things you have to do at the house before you move in, just like we spoke about. So you could see some people are actually spending thirty thousand pound. Some people are getting away with spending nothing because they're moving to something that's been done already. For example, Inverary Street with the beautiful kitchens and bathrooms yeah. in there. That's just a move-in job, and then you could do the attic room later on um, to your heart's content. Just strap and board it and line it, and it's the job's done. But that, to me, is an eye opener. Yeah. Nearly enough fifteen thousand pound on average for people to move. So this is a thing you've got to really think about can you is it is it worth doing that spend the 15 grand and just put just repurpose or as i said before spend it fifteen thousand pound on improving your house or or you know subdividing a room which could be subdivided um the classic example of that is taping close mm -hmm. it's got three bedrooms upstairs but the actually in the in the original model of the house then the the it was actually five bedrooms upstairs with the same footprint so you could pick, you could stick up two stud partitions again and have five bedrooms back. Yeah. So for some days in a three bedroom, and they think to themselves, "Wait a minute, I need to move because I've not got enough bedrooms." Put two, two stud partitions up there and create the five bedrooms job done with the yeah. same floor space. I've seen a few. There's a few in Glen Office that you could the, 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 the some of the builds, and you could do a, the two bedroom and a three bedroom quite easily, yeah. and they're good. They're good sized rooms. Oh, but my kids need separate rooms. <laughs> like, <laughs> I grew up in the same room as my brother. It's oh, like, well, that's just the things yeah, you did. That. It's like, what's harmed? Does nobody want to pay that price anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's quite an interesting uh, figure. But um, not surprising, considering everything that we've covered today, uh, that's actually involved in an actual move. So just, I think, like you say, have absolute clarity on what you're, you're getting yourself into. Can you afford it? Can you take the stress? Do you really need to? Or could you stay where you are? 
absolutely. This is this is all about getting the right people around to identify the untapped potential in your current home. I think, um, and 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 avoiding the possibility that you might make the wrong move in the first place. So I I'm always a big fan of saying make your decision based on facts rather than someone else's opinion. Um, yeah. Classic is you know you know what it's like in Facebook. It's like people will go to Facebook and they'll ask a question and then every man their dog gives them an answer and it's like have you done that? No, but I thought I would just tell you. <laughs> Like so, how could you give that answer if you've never done it yourself? And you don't know what it's going to lead to. That's yeah. the that's the difference. That's why you get experts around to talk about your existing situation and what you should be doing next. Thanks for coming on the show, Richard. Yeah, really man. appreciate that. Yeah, so if anybody good. any more information, uh, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can go and you can read the blog as well. Um, and it's and it's in its raw form, the script itself on these links uh, if you want to do that. Or you can just uh, message us direct on these posts, or you can contact us in the usual office numbers, uh, email address info at fiveproperties.co.uk. But there's links to our contact pages anyway in, yeah. this, uh, in this post and this email and this uh, online post as well. Uh, until next time, guys, uh, it's bye bye from us. Have a fantastic weekend, and I'll see you for uh, Sunday night's update at seven o'clock tomorrow night. Bye bye for yeah. now. Cheers, Tom. Bye.